Welcome to today's talk. This is an excerpt from a larger research project that I'm working on. I'm looking forward to hearing your ideas too, based from this presentation. My talk today discusses the following topic. So, scholarship has established how one of the key attractions of the early 20th century vaudeville circuit was seeing beautiful actresses performing in the latest, most expensive fashions. These performers understood that their luxurious costumes supported the narrative of the show and the performer's personal brand, in part because their costumes performed via the body and extended to the space of the stage and to broader into the social, cultural and economic landscapes that they inhabited. But in some cases, the costume went rogue, behaving in unintended ways and telling audiences stories that differed from the show's intended narrative. This paper, therefore, draws on notions of agency in costume and on Barbieri's ideas of costumes that fail in order to analyse early 20th century accounts of costumes behaving badly. It also draws on Andrew's theories of textile semantics and Trimmingham's ideas of kinetic empathy within costume to consider how the costumes went rogue by disappointing audiences and eliciting responses of disgust linked to prevalent social anxieties around poverty and disease among the era's uh, poverty and disease. What I won't discuss in detail here are the added impacts of this bad behaviour, which was in direct contrast to the work of producers, designers and actors of the era like David Belasco, Joe Webber and Lou Fields, pictured here, and Charlie Chaplin, who deliberately used ill-fitting, shabby, soiled costumes that signalled poverty to inject pathos and humour into their performances. In 1908, Anna Marble, press agent and author of a fashion and gossip column in the weekly New York theatre publication Variety, offered the following advice to the manager of a production number called The Love Waltz. She said, it's time to send some of those velvet court robes to the cleansers. Marble, and later Hattie, the wife of Variety publisher Syme Silverman, offered detailed descriptions and critiques of the clothes worn by female vaudeville artists, including style tips that promoted high standards of dress upon the stage. Marble and Hattie, who wrote under the pseudonym The Skirt, heaped lavish praise on performers who wore beautiful, expensive ensembles and poured scorn on performers who wore ugly, soiled and shabby gowns. Trimmingham writes that, Designers and practitioners infuse costume with its agency through their kinetic empathy and, as the costume designer knows deep in their bones, through the reciprocal kinetic energy of the watcher and witness in live performance. This helps to explain why a beautiful gown could elicit a positive response and an ugly gown a negative response. The influences of vaudeville costumes, therefore, extended like tendrils from the stage to the social, cultural and economic landscapes of 20th century America via the audience and the mass media. And in columns like The Woman in Variety, which highlighted performance costumes, good and bad behaviour, this in turn greatly influenced the costuming codes of the vaudeville circuit. The kinetic Empathy that gives costume its agency is grounded, in part, to cultural understandings of textile semantics. That is, the communicative, communicative qualities in textiles which inform the generation and exchange of meaning between the textile practitioner and the viewer. This is what allows costumes to, as Trimmingham writes, touch a visceral nerve within us. For example, velvets and furs make us want to reach out and touch them because they are so soft, but because they also carry a semiotic weight of luxury and exclusivity. I posit, therefore, that the skirt's critiques of shabby, soiled gowns were so vitriolic, not just because they disappointed audiences who expected to see the latest fashions, but because the costumes were touching the wrong visual nerve within audiences. Instead of exciting viewers' imaginations and eliciting feelings of pleasure, costumes like the Morrissey sisters' shabby velvet gowns elicited dis feelings of disgust within audiences because they communicated messages linked to widespread social anxieties of the era around poverty. 
The links of shabbiness with poverty in the mass media occurred during what Westgate has called one of the most significant periods of investigation, reflection and legislation regarding urban poverty in US history. This period, which became known as the Progressive Era, transformed the ways in which the wealthy Americans engaged with urban poverty and shifted public discourse from Victorian navities of poverty being the result of personal moral failings to modern theories that linked poverty to social and economic factors grounded in historical, geographical and philosophic developments in the US. This included the aggregation of the poor into separate districts districts and waves of new immigration and the dep economic depression of the 1890s. Nevertheless, it was still socially undesirable to appear poor and the press offered tips to help people avoid appearing shabby. The Sun, for example, noted in 1908 that by the time March comes, winter street suits have begun to show wear and tear and the separate coats of the winter season, if not shabby, are a trifle heavy. The article was accompanied by a fashion illustration of three young women wearing the new spring fashions described in the article, and we see those here. Similarly, an ad in the Evening World for Macy's department store in March 1909 stated, the winter suits and overcoats of most men are beginning to be plainly shabby. Indeed, during the progressive era, one of the key symbolic uses of clothing was to maintain social status, and this extended to the stage. Many actresses of the era spent a fortune each year on their stage ensembles and publicised that knowledge too, as Schweitzer says, prevent undesirable performers from gaining access to the stage and to cement their social status of actresses of distinction. The French star, Anna Held, for example, who rose from being a poor Parisian factory girl to a major American star was one such actress. Indeed, Paul McGinn writes that the cleanest, least smelly, most smartly dressed person will have the competitive edge in society, but that requires money and time and an occupation that doesn't involve dirt and sweat, even though we know that acting does. The association between poverty and filth is strong and the motivation to avoid poverty in order to ward off filth is correspondently strong. Appearing poor on the stage, therefore, unless it was deliberately for a role, could have disastrous consequences for an actress, rendering her undesirable and keeping her from being cast in the future. Costumes that unintentionally communicated disease or illness also had the potential to ruin a production. The constant threat of disease loomed large in early 20th century New York. For example, The Sun reported on the 1st of January 1909 that the number of deaths in New York City in 1908 from measles and scarlet fever had increased from 1907. Furthermore, different diseases flared up at different times of the year. This led one doctor in 1908, for example, to use language that would be understood by the general public when explaining his approach to disease management, that is, the language of fashion, shopping, and the theatre. The doctor's analogy, printed here, was underscored by the editorial decision to print his interview on the same page as the latest spring fashion news from Paris. And we see these images and clippings here. Indeed, it appeared to be measles season in New York when the skirt bemoaned that if one's skin was the colour of some of the pink on stage, we would be rushed to the doctors for fear we had scarlet fever or the measles. This comparison was more than just a snide comment. Rather, it pointed to costuming behaving badly. McGinn writes that the sensation of disgust is contact sensitive. The natural response to a disgusting object is thus to put it beyond the scope of touch. Instead of communicating luxury, health and cleanliness under the lights like a champagne colour, measles pink tights conjured images of deadly diseases that claimed members from all social classes and that caused a visceral response of disgust in the viewer but also in the reader alike. The most badly behaving costumes, however, were those which were both dirty and shabby, as these garments, more than just dirt or shabbiness alone, elicited the dual anxieties of disease and poverty. 
During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the unsanitary conditions of the poverty-stricken, overcrowded tenement houses on New York's Lower East Side experienced regular outbreaks of deadly diseases, including tuberculosis, diseases, and dys dysentery and measles. Old, soiled costumes tapped into anxieties about these diseases that could start in the slums and rage throughout the city. The skirts review here did not state what had soiled the gowns in the country club, but as McGinn writes, a second major category of disgust elicitors is that of bodily substances, particularly those we deem waste products. These include skin grease and stale sweat. Skin grease and stale sweat on clothing are caused not just by hard work, like dancing on the stage, for example, but also by fevers from sickness. McGinn also writes that dirt itself elicits disgust as it evokes repulsion and a desire to erase it. Furthermore, dirt can carry disease. Excessive dirtiness is interpreted as death-related. Dirty flesh is akin to dead flesh and too much dirt threatens life. In an era where epidemics of deadly diseases were commonplace and swept through unsanitary slums, sweaty, badly soiled costumes repulsed audiences with the threat of death itself. McGinn also notes that modern consumerism has its roots in the human condition as a strenuous, repressive flight from disgust. This was evident in the early 20th century New York, not just through the consumption of fashion in shops and on the stage, but in the rise of commercial cleaning of fabrics and textiles. From 1909, steam laundries were promoted as preservers of public health in New York. The laundries were described as high class and they claimed only to hire healthy persons and have a dedicated cleaning staff. The article mentioned here in the slide compared these industrial laundries to the small home laundress, who is generally a woman who lives in one of the poorer classes of tenement houses and does all her work in her rooms. She has not the accommodation to wash and dry the clothes with frequent changes of water or to hang the articles even in the fresh air. The odours from the adjoining apartments saturate the clothes and in many cases there are sick persons nearby. Often the children in the laundress's house are suffering from measles or something just as bad and when the clothes are returned to their owner, the germs are lodged in the clothes and spread to members of the family. The article here which stated this was surrounded also by advertisements for steam laundries and carpet cleaning services. There was no excuse, therefore, for badly behaved costumes like those in the love walls, which should have gone to the cleaners. Audiences that were well aware of public discourses around health, poverty and cleanliness flocked to vaudeville fashion displays for entertainment and for tips on how to dress, because if they wanted to see dirt and poverty on the stage, then they'd deliberately seek it out. Indeed, there was an entire genre of theatrical productions deliberately set in the slums of New York, which included shabby, dirty costumes as part of the design. This included a production called The Easiest Way from 1909, directed by American theatrical presario and sonographer David Belasco, which included in the second act was set in a tenderloin flop house. And even within this show, the audience appreciated that the dirty, shabby clothes hanging in the wardrobe on stage were props, while the use of fashion to communicate the protagonist's wealth and desirability was so successful that some of the show's ensembles received glowing praise from the skirt. Human attention is finite. So directing it towards beautiful objects that carry no hint of the gross prevents us from dwelling unhealthily on the noxious objects and processes that confront our very nature, McGinn writes. Costume that behaves badly, however, draw our attention to noxious objects and circumstances that we wish to forget by eliciting a visceral reaction of disgust. In this respect, the costumes discussed here failed by touching the wrong nerve within the audience, evoking anxieties about poverty and disease, rather than the allowing the audiences to forget about these realities, even for a brief time. Thank you.